1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to read verses 1 to 28, page 1020. Now, brothers, I want to clarify for you the gospel I proclaim to you. You received it and have taken your stand on it. You're also saved by it if you hold to the message I proclaim to you, unless you believe to no purpose. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received. Get your hands ready. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Kephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to over 500 brothers at one time, most of whom remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one abnormally born. He also appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by God's grace, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not ineffective. However, I worked more than any of them, yet not I, but God's grace that was with me. Therefore, whether it is I or they, so we preach, and so you have believed. Now, if Christ is preached as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is without foundation, and so is your faith. In addition... We are found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified about God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. Therefore, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If we've placed our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. But now, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward at his coming the people of God. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he abolishes all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished is death. For he has put everything under his feet. But when it says everything is put under him, it is obvious that he who puts everything under him is the exception. And when everything is subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who subjected everything to him, so that God may be all in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, there's an outline inside your newsletters there on the left-hand side, uh, some household questions up on the top right-hand side. Let me encourage you over lunch today as you reach to grab some food, remember those five fingers, maybe encourage each other to remember them, uh, that simple explanation of the gospel. God willing, there'll be an opportunity at the end uh, to ask any questions. I don't know if you realise the significance of January 2022 this year. Uh, It was actually the 30th anniversary of an event in Australian history that many regard as impossible. Uh, In December 1991, a young, fit, healthy medical student called James Scott went hiking in Nepal in the Himalayas. Uh, By December 22, he was lost and a massive rescue operation began. Uh, By January 1992, all hope was lost and in February, the searchers at a great financial cost to his own family, made one last helicopter pass over the search region. Someone spotted a blue sleeping bag flapping in the wind. The helicopter landed. Those who are on the helicopter have said that they expected to find a corpse, but they found James Scott, 25 kilograms lighter, with malnutrition, still alive. I don't know if you remember that, 43 days surviving on one Mars bar and snow. 
Uh, it was a remarkable survival story, at least for Mars bars. And he's now a child trauma psychologist in Queensland. He's using his own experience dealing with kids. He still suffers neurological and eyesight damage. He has constant double vision, so he wasn't able to be the surgeon he always hoped to be, for which I'm thankful. But he is alive. Many, if not most, people and media outlets at the time reacted with this one word, impossible. Uh, Within days, massive doubt was cast on his story. Uh, People picked holes. If you Google him online, the websites are still there and the articles exposing all the holes and labelling him a charlatan and a fraud who wanted publicity. In fact, some even went so far as to say it was a publicity exercise for Mars bars. Uh, The fact remains that he did survive. His lasting physical damage is a testimony to that, as to his profession and the possible survival is true. Many people have a same or a similar reaction to the resurrection of Jesus, don't they? Uh, It's not hard to Google resurrection of Jesus and find all sorts of websites that pick holes in it. They regard it as impossible. They minimise it, they reduce it. But today we're going to see that the facts remain. The impossible event is true and its consequences are truly remarkable. Let me pray and we're going to dive into it now. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you that you saved James Scott, uh, that you kept him alive. I thank you that you raised your son from the dead. I thank you that the consequences of the resurrection of Jesus, the physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus are immense, confronting but with great hope. Help us to be assured of the truth of that today. Help us to be comforted by the hope that it brings. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in this series, if you remember, uh, we're looking at the real Jesus Uh, Ben's been taking us through the reality of Jesus' life, his birth and his real death as we looked at last week. Today we're looking at his real resurrection. Uh, In each of these sections, the reality of Jesus affects our lives in a very real way. If you cast your minds back to the first sermon in the series, uh, in the birth and life of Jesus, we're assured of the true historical reality of this man called Jesus. Uh, Last week, in the real death of Jesus, as we looked at John chapter 13, we saw real power, the the power of the whole universe exercised in what way? In real service. As Jesus knelt down and washed the feet of the people he was going to die for. And today we're going to look at the resurrection of Jesus and its very real importance for who we are. And to do that, we're going to spend some time in 1 Corinthians Uh, Many of us are familiar with 1 Corinthians, aren't we? Uh, Many of us have dived into it or at least heard it quoted. Uh, It's a letter written by a bloke called Paul to a church that he established in Corinth. Uh, Corinth was a port city. Uh, It was renowned for being cosmopolitan and fairly immoral. Uh, The church Paul helped establish there is described in the first few verses. If you've got your Bibles there, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verses 2 to 4. To God's church at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus and called as saints, with all those in every place who call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, theirs and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of God's grace given to you in Christ Jesus. Did you notice the delightful description of God's mob in Corinth there? They belong to God. They have a boss called Jesus. They are acceptable to God. In fact, God has done something for them that has taken them and set them apart as unique to God. They have received God's immense generosity undeserved. We remember them as one of the most dysfunctional churches in history, don't we? But did you notice how Paul starts? And do you notice how when he describes them, uh, there are no caveats or subclauses. That's who they are, despite their reputation across the ages. So as Paul writes this letter to them, and it's one of four, we've only got two of them, but one of four, he is really helping them to live as God has already made them. 
They're God's people. They're acceptable to God. Jesus has saved them. And so through these letters, Paul deals with a number of questions, a number of false theologies, a a number of immoral ways of behaving, and he continually reminds them, this is who you are. So live like it with God's help. He starts with the death of Jesus in the first three chapters. And in those three chapters, he talks about how the death of Jesus undercuts all of the world's wisdom. It turns it on its head. And so it's appropriate that he finishes the letter with the resurrection of Jesus. And that's where we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm at point two on the outline. He wants to close the letter by clarifying what he proclaimed to them. Did you see that there in the first verse now, brothers? That's just a general term for everyone sitting in the pews. I want to clarify for you the gospel, the good news that I proclaimed, that you received, and by which you've been saved. And when you look at what he is saying here, he's not talking about an experience first and foremost. He's not even talking about a lifestyle. He's talking about a set of facts, a body of truth, a key set of real events. It's not a vibe or a feeling. It's a body of truth that is spoken into the world, which sets people free. And it's very simple. We summarised it in the kids' talk, didn't we? Uh, but look there in verse 3. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Christ died, was buried, Christ rose on the third day, for our sins, according to the Scriptures. It is really very simple, isn't it? But I want you to notice some key aspects of it. The death of Jesus is for our sins. Jesus' death deals with our rebellion against God, our sin, the attitude and action that says, I'm God and God's not. Jesus' death is a substitute for us. In his death, he takes what we deserve, God's right judgment of pretenders, people who want to be God instead of God. Jesus really did die. That's why you've got that second phrase. He was buried. Remember the Romans knew how to do death? They knew a dead person. There's no doubt about this. Jesus did not swoon. Jesus wasn't just unconscious. He didn't just faint. He was dead and buried. And he was raised from the dead. He didn't stay in the tomb, did he? If you remember back to the sermon that we had at Easter, those ladies saw where he was buried. They knew the tomb. They went to the tomb and the tomb was? Oh, it was empty, wasn't it? And in the resurrection of Jesus, he is unique. No one else has been resurrected in this way. And the resurrection of Jesus is God's stamp of approval that says his death was enough. Death can't hold him because he has beaten it by dying for humans as the perfect sacrifice. If there is no resurrection of the dead no resurrection of Jesus, then he's just like you and me, isn't he? Just better behaved. And all we've got is a good example. But his resurrection, well, that's a statement that God has done exactly as he promised. He's dealt with the thing that we all must face, our death for our sin. Jesus' resurrection is a statement from God that Jesus has paid our debt. And it's not a mistake, is it? It's not a random event. It's according to the Scriptures. This has always been God's plan, right from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It's not random. It's not accidental. It's just as God promised, a body of facts, and they're verifiable. They're verifiable through history or through personal experience. Take your pick. Because you notice what happens in verses 5 to 8? 
Uh, he, he appeared to Kephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. And then he appeared to over 500 brothers at one time, most of whom remained in the present. Some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all as to one abnormally born. He also appeared to me. There, there are eyewitnesses. In fact, there are so many eyewitnesses that you can look up the Jerusalem phone directory and ring them and go and talk to them. They're still alive. At the time this is written, you can contact them and check the facts. There is no historical doubt about the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. But it's more than just a set of facts. It's a set of facts that changes people. There is personal testimony. I think that's what Paul is doing in verses 8 to 11. Just as striking as the historical truth is the personal transformation of a bloke like Saul who became Paul, the bloke who killed Christians, the bloke who approved the stoning of Stephen, the bloke who was probably there when Jesus was crucified. And that bloke met these facts, this man, and it completely changed him. It made him someone abnormally born, verse 8. Jesus also appeared to me, and for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by God's grace, I am what I am. His grace towards me was not ineffective. However, I worked more than any of them. Yet not I, but God's grace that was with me. Therefore, whether it is I or they, so we preach and so you have believed. What a change. Uh, What was Paul doing? Persecuting. What's he doing now? Proclaiming. He was killing Jesus. Now he's proclaiming Jesus. He was killing Jesus' mob and now he's writing to Jesus' mob that he helped set up in Corinth. Not only are these historical truths, they're transformative truths. They change people as people meet what? Did you notice the word repeated a number of times in Paul's testimony there? It's the word grace, isn't it? Do you notice how many times he uses that there? By God's grace. Uh, God's grace is working with me. His grace towards me was not ineffective. Three times. I received what I didn't deserve. I was given what I didn't earn. I was shown God's unmerited, unwarranted generosity at the very moment I was killing his mob. And look what it's done to me. It's completely changed me. Paul wants to clarify the good news, the truth, a set of historical facts that changes the lives of people, a set of historical facts around the death and resurrection of Jesus for our sins according to God's plan. It's true and it changes. So before we go on any further, let me ask you three quick questions. The questions are quick. The answers might not be so. Are you encouraged by that account of how historically true the resurrection of Jesus is? If you were asked to proclaim the good news or clarify it, is that what you would have said? Are you encouraged by what these truths do in the lives of people? Now, if these truths aren't true, so to speak, if it's false, then we've got a real problem, haven't we? (laughs) That's what Paul does next. I'm at point three on the outline in verses 12 to 19. He raises it there in verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? It's a fairly important question, isn't it? It seems that there are some within the church at Corinth saying, (laughs) resurrection of the dead, what a load of garbage. That sounds remarkable, doesn't it? that people in God's mob would say that. And let me tell you, it's not that remarkable in Australia. Jeremy Greaves, who's the Anglican Bishop of the Northern Region in Brisbane, is on the record in an ABC interview saying, I'd be happy to abandon all the creeds. Sarah McNeil, when she was appointed the Bishop of Grafton in 2013, is on the public record in a sermon in church saying, Jesus did not die for your sins. 
You see, the Corinthian church is not that unique, is it? The same lies, the same denial of the resurrection is still here today, and it's not just out there, is it? It's within our mob, our denomination, even amongst some of our leaders. Why would you do that? Why would you deny it? Oh, we're given no clear answers here in 1 Corinthians, but uh, let me make two suggestions. The first suggestion is they deny it, just like people denied James Scott's survival. Just can't comprehend it. It's impossible. Can't happen. When people die, they stay dead. (laughs) Uh, There's no historical track record of this stuff happening. Funnily enough, that's true because everyone else who died were sinners, so they're going to stay dead, aren't they? This bloke was not a sinner. So, of course, there's no track record, but that's one option. I think there's another option which fits within 1 Corinthians, and it's mentioned there in verse 35 if you've got your Bibles open. But someone will say, how are the dead raised? Or what kind of body will they have when they come back? This one's a little more subtle. So they're not denying the resurrection. They're denying physical resurrection. Jesus was raised spiritually. Jesus was raised in his soul. But he wasn't raised physically. He didn't have a real body. And and I think this fits with the world of Corinth and what's happening in the church in Corinth because people at that time, just like people today, split the two. The flesh is evil because that gets corrupted and is immoral and affected by sin, but souls and spirits, they're always pure. And so it's okay for Jesus to be raised spiritually, but why would God raise him physically when Flesh is so evil. Flesh is so corruptible. Flesh is prone to sin. Uh, And when you have that distinction and when you split the two, well, then it's okay to go and do whatever you want in the flesh because it's the soul that matters. It's really a blank check to do whatever you want, isn't it? Because it's really the soul that matters. And that's the teaching that was in the church at that time. It leads to all sorts of problems and it leads to a real problem at the heart of our message. And Paul unpacks this in a series of but-if statements in verses 12 to 19. One of my favourite lecturers at Bible college was a bloke called Mark Badley. Uh, Mark had a number of quirks. He started every 8am lecture by opening a can of Coke. Uh, The lecture would always start with a and then we get into God's word. Mark's greatest strength was his ability to show where theological decisions ended up. So you believe that, Bernard. Have you thought where that leads? And that's what Paul does here. If we deny the resurrection of Jesus, let me just show you where we end up. I'm just going to go through this very quickly. In verse 13, if there's no resurrection of the dead, Jesus is not raised. In verse 14, if Jesus is not raised, then what Paul has proclaimed is a lie and you've all been duped. In verse 15, if they've proclaimed a lie, they've misrepresented God and God is incapable of being trusted. In verse 16, let me state the issue again. For if the dead are not raised, Christ has not been raised. In verse 17, if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then what's happened to your sins? They're not paid for, are they? And you're still living in them. In verse 18, if Christians are still in their sins, then you've got no hope in death. And in verse 19, here's the kicker. If you believe in a lie, you're a bunch of morons, literally. There's no one else to be more pitied in the world. It's a pretty devastating chain of logic, isn't it? And the heart of it is here in verse 17. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then your sins have not been forgiven. And the heart of that is in verse 15. If God can't raise Jesus from the dead, then we have no hope. Jesus' life was not good enough to pay for our sins. And our future looks like a future of brokenness and restlessness in sin with no hope past the grave. 
Jesus is just like us. He's dead and buried and all we've got is, is an example. Uh, it's pretty devastating, isn't it? And it's really important at this point to understand what Paul is doing. Notice how he started this chapter. The resurrection's true. We've got that backdrop. And let me just show you what it's like if the resurrection isn't true. And notice how we've got these two contrasts. We know it's true. We know it's a fact. We know it is a historically verifiable event that transforms people. So against that backdrop, look at the consequences if it hasn't taken place. And it strikes at the very promise of God. Nothing God says can be trusted if Jesus is not raised from the dead. Nothing God promised will ever be given to you if Jesus is not raised from the dead. Nothing that God hopes out for, holds out for our future hope is ever possible if Jesus has not been raised from the dead. And all we can look forward to is a future of being Casper the friendly ghost floating around if Jesus has not been raised from the dead. It gives a blank check to sin. It's a full surrender to brokenness. And it says to the world that God couldn't beat sin if Jesus is not raised from the dead. Do you notice how verse 20 starts? But now. But now. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. It's true. He's shown that. It changes people. He has shown that. Jesus is alive and has been raised. So he closes, and I'm going to close with these three great comforts. The first comfort is in verses 21 to 23. It's the comfort that if sin and death came through one man, so does life and salvation. Adam brought what into the world? Death. Jesus brings what into the world? Life, salvation, a future hope. Just look at him. He is what we will become. The first comfort is knowing that Jesus' resurrection says publicly, historically and personally, sin is beaten. Death is done. Adam brought the curse. Jesus brought salvation. The second comfort is in verses 23 to 26. It's the comfort that one day everything will be in a right order. Everything will be where it belongs. God's commitment to reversing the curse of sin, the brokenness of rebellion against him, is, is the fulfilment in Jesus of everything being put in place. What will be defeated? Death. Who will rule the world? Jesus. What will creation be doing? Operating the way it should. And it's happened already, hasn't it? The resurrection of Jesus is God's physical stamp saying, I approve this world and I'm committed to making it right. Just look at the empty grave and look at that bloke walking around eating fish with his mates. It will be set right. The third comfort, verses 27 to 28. It's the comfort of looking forward to a day when we will be truly human. In verse 27, Paul quotes Psalm 8. I don't know if you've read Psalm 8 lately, but go and read it. It is a statement of what it means to be truly human. And because Jesus beat the thing that breaks us, sin, we've got a hope that we will be what God designed us to be one day fully, truly, utterly, perfectly human. And it will be, be possible because Jesus beat the thing that breaks us, sin, by walking out of the grave. Well, we've covered a lot there, haven't we? We've covered a huge chunk, and really we've just scratched the surface. But let me finish with this. The resurrection of the dead is real. It is a physical, historical truth because Jesus was raised from the dead. There are eyewitnesses and it's verifiable and it's personally authentic. Just look at Paul. It holds out great comfort to people because it says the thing that breaks you is beaten. 
Your sins are forgiven. It says that this broken world is not all we're going to have. It's going to be restored. And it says that one day you will be made truly human. Everything God designed you to be. What other message does our world need? Why would you deny it? Why would you offer the world a grave where Jesus is still lying when the truth is he walked out and he sits at God's right hand? Let me pray. Father, thank you for the real resurrection of Jesus. Thank you that it is historically true, personally authentic, and it transforms. Thank you for the hope and comfort it brings. Help us not to turn from it and help us to always talk about it. Amen. Any quick questions? Mr. Stiller. Abnormally born. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky phrase, isn't it, there? It's in uh, verse 8, uh, abnormally born. Uh, I think it means that he was born in a way he did not choose, which carries on to the, into the next three verses where he emphasises grace. Okay, so it was a birth not of his choice or in the way he designed, and... That was because it was a birth by God's grace. So I think that's the best understanding of it in the context. Does that make sense? Thumbs up. That's just for the cameras.